All right, so people are coming in. All right, so hi everybody. Um, so we are here with um, Colby College Spanish professors, um, Tiffany Cregan Miller and Anna Almeida Cohen. So thank you guys for being here. I'm Julia, I'm from the Maine Film Center. Um, and this is part of our Cinema in Conversation series. Um, and this is actually the second to last um, webinar that we have this semester. We'll probably have, hopefully have more next semester, so stay tuned. Um, but so this is about um, the film La Llorona, which I practiced saying before this, because I am not a Spanish speaker. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a Guatemalan horror film about uh, a genocidal dictator. Oh, and I think we have Jairo here, connected to audio. Hi, can you hear us? Yeah, fine, and you? Hi, good to see you. Good to see you too. All okay. right, so I was- Hey, Anna. Hola, Jairo, hi, Jairo. Awesome. So I was just saying, I'm Julia. I'm from the Maine Film Center. Um, and I was just introducing um, you and your film, which I saw today in the daylight <laughs> because I'm not a horror film person. Um, it was really good. So, so La Llorona is about um, a genocidal dictator facing the consequences of his atrocities. Um, and I'll leave it there, but it centers around this myth that I think we'll get we'll get into a Latin American myth that many of you as, as Spanish students might actually uh, be familiar with. Um, La Llorona, the weeping woman um, and sort of a, a ghost that mourns her dead children. Um, so yeah, so we're really lucky to have you guys here. So this is uh, the director Jairo Bustamante. Um, and so we're very pleased to host this discussion. Um, and so if you have any questions, I know some of you emailed questions to me earlier, so I'll hang on to those. Um, and if you have other questions, just feel free to put them in the Q&A box. Um, and yeah, and we'll, we'll get to those later. So thanks so much guys, and I'll hand the mic over to you. Great, thank you, Julia. <clears throat> So, Shokak Ank Ay Wonokel, Lautsi Witch, Srinupi, Tiffany Cregan Miller, Chokari Harupi, Anal Medako, and Ochti Honelag, Wawe Panimati Hopel, Colby, Yorsama, Rik Inritak Molach Studios, Latino Americanos, Chokari Molach Kashlan, Nape Nikahoni Nikamatio Shir, Chiwe Wonokel, Romaish Koki Kikin, Chokani Kamatio Shir, Chikari Molach Studios, Latino Americanos, Chokari Molach Kashlan, Romai Toik, Rik Inritsi Honem Wakamin. Chuka Nikamatio Shik Chikeri Main Film Center, Chuka Railroad Square Cinema, Romaki Samach. Hanila Yokiko Romaish Go Awe, Sheyai Ramach, Keri Wakamini Kahoyo, Sihonrik in Honi Malach, Achin, Ach Silo Achipel, Achishimolev, Rihairo Bustamante, Shupan Re Silo Achipel, La Yorona Re Hunare, Nikamatio Shik Chiwe, Nikachok Katsihonem Wakamin, Matios. So good evening, everyone. We wanted to start the evening off with a greeting in Kachikel Maya, which you heard in the film. It is one of the 22 Mayan languages still spoken in Guatemala today. My name is Tiffany Cregan Miller, and this is my colleague, Anna Almeida Cohen. And we are both professors at Colby College. We work in the Spanish and Latin American studies departments at Colby. First, we wanna thank you all for being here with us. And we would like to thank the Latin American studies department and Spanish department for their support for the event. And we would like to thank the Maine Film Center and Railroad Square Cinema for all of their uh, work and their support. We are so very happy that you are all here sharing your time. And now we wanna talk with a foundational figure in Guatemalan cinema, Jairo Bustamante, who directed the film La Llorona, which came out just this year. Thank you so much. And now let's begin our conversation. My colleague, Ana Almeida Cohen, will get us started. 
Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, Heido, for being here. We're very excited to have this conversation with you and to really be able to engage in uh, your work, especially with La Llorona, and then to open the floor and hear the questions from our attendees. So to start off the conversation, um, I'd like for you to talk about why you chose the genre of horror in La Llorona to tell the story of the genocide in, in Guatemala of the 1980s. Um, your first two films, Ishkanul and Temblores, are dramas, but why did you choose horror? And in particular, even more so this legend, La Llorona, this Latin American uh, myth of this weeping woman to tell the story of the genocide in Guatemala during the 1980s. So hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you to invite me. And you know, Anna, I wanted to tell you that it, it because I really love the genre, the horror genre, genre, but the true is, even if I love it, the true is it was more an, a strategical decision because um, I don't know if the audience know the story about Guatemala, but um, we, we had a very, very strong uh, war uh, during 40 years and even now all this success continue affecting the people in Guatemala and continue affecting the structure of my society. So people don't want to talk about that. People want to deny what happens. Uh, I think in a, in a big part because guilty uh, feeling and, and in other part because in a way, the, the most part of the victim in the conflict was indigenous people. And I think Guatemalan mix or white Guatemalan people are still thinking that indigenous people are inferior. So they are not any interest about what happened at that moment. So, so I don't want to have only um, an international audience. I wanted to, to touch my local audience too. So I start doing um, um, a kind of um, a market um, research about how kind of film Guatemalan people are watching. And they are watching superhero films and, and horror films. Mm -hmm. So I decide to, in a, in, a, in a way, to costume my story in that gender. And, and the, the concept was Guatemala is a motherland crying because all these disparate uh, children or, or, or kids or, or people during the war. So in, in that way, we were thinking about Guatemala, like this mother crying and, and La Llorona came. And when La Llorona came in our universe, we, we just find it very, very natural because She's a kind of a hero in, in Latin America. And, and she came with this oral language within. So, and, and right now I'm very happy because I could, thanks to that, transform a little bit the legend. Because in the end, the legend, the original one, is, is really machist and misogynistic because it's all the time, even in, in, in in the different versions, it's a, it's a woman who is a woman who who's crying because a man quit her, and in some version it's not just that. In some version, she arrived to kill his daughter or his uh, sons. I don't remember the, the different versions because this man quit her. So we decide to make a Jorona more. Justice, justice here and make a Girona crying because of relevant things as a, uh, than, a no, than a man. And another defining quality of the film is your use of magical realism. And in particular, this genre that includes different elements of, of magic within reality. Can you tell us a bit more about why you use this style of fiction in the film also within the story alongside with horror? Oh, yeah, you know, it's, it's very strange because normally um, outside of Latin America, people think that um, magical realism is just um, artistic movement. 
But for us, it's not. For us, it's, it's part of our life. We are living all the time with that. Magic and realism and psycho magic are our best friend because we, in the most part of the, of the continent, we are living in, in, in countries with our state who take care of, uh, about the people. So we need a kind, of a, a kind of protection, we need a kind of hope, and that protection, the only people who, who we are trust or believe in, in that moment are all these divinities. So for that, I wanted to translate a little bit not just the folklore, but kind of a picture of my society. So following up on Anna's question no, um, and, and this idea of the division between the natural and the supernatural worlds, can you also comment on the intersections between fiction and reality in the film, specifically taking into account the parallels between General Monteverde's trial in the film and then also Efrain Rios Mont's trial in Guatemala that occurred in, in May 2013. Yeah, you know, there is something magical with uh, genre uh, movies because people, uh, the audience came to the movie when they know that this uh, is an horror film or a suspense film, they came with a kind of, um, they are more open. They know that you will touch them. So they are, they are ready to be taught. And, and I think it's, it was, and I, I think that was very important for the film because people came, they knew that something will arrive. And, and we wanted to surprise people, not saying at the end they are dead, or at the end, she is not La Llorona, or, or a twist like that. I wanted to say, at the end, I will not touch you like you are waiting. I will touch you with the reality, and I will present you the horror, the real horror, who is more horror horrific than, the, than a fiction. on that in terms of, of the audiences and, and how they reacted to the film. How has the film been received in Guatemala and, and, and then also kind of within that, how has it been received with, uh, by Guatemalan Maya communities, specifically the Yishil and the Kachiquel? If you can talk a little bit about that. Oh, right now, it's, it's a little bit complicated to answer that question because we released the film one week before well, uh, the block, the lock of the country because COVID. So we had to to release the film in in by internet uh, in a platform, and it's a little bit more complicated because not all the population in Guatemala are have access to that. So we are not sure about that. We are planning a a kind of a tour to present the film in the communities. We did that with my first film, Mishkanul, and it was a big success. Uh, we had more audience doing that than in the theatrical, in, in normal theatrical, I mean. So, um, so we will do that. But right now, after the, the um, you know, this big news that Guatemala, La Llorona is the entry for the Oscars, representing Guatemala. After that, I think the whole country is still being proud about, about La Llorona. But it's very, it's very funny in a way because normally Guatemalan people don't want to talk about that subject or they don't, they don't like the subject that I present. Uh, but they, they really like all the glamour around what happened with my films. <laughs> so it's a, like, we have to use that, you know, if, if, that, can, if, if, that, is a, if that is a tool, we have to use that tool too. Yeah. And continuing the conversation about Guatemala and the location of, of the film, can you tell us a bit more about shooting on site in this house? So we see that in the film, that the majority of the film takes place in a house and it's a space that at first seems impenetrable because no one can really get through, but then eventually we see the sounds of the protesters penetrating as well as objects that go through the windows. 
and then eventually sort of this water that's seeping in. Um, so if you can tell us a bit more why you decided to just to center the story, the, the majority of the story in, in the house. You know, I was wondering how that people who were responsible about the genocide feel during night. Because during day, they are all the time telling that they are heroes. And they are just saying that thanks, thanks to the genocide, we are freedom now, no? and we don't have communism in our frontiers. And, but I can imagine that in the inside, very, very deep on them, they, they can understand that they made something very bad. And so I wanted to be there. I wanted to be inside the night with them just to understand how they will react or, or if that, that ax or that soul that they kill came to haunt them. And so I decided to be in, the, in, in inside of the evil house. And, and I wanted to, I wanted to lock them there because normally in Guatemala, uh, the majority of that people uh, just still free or, or die free. So I wanted to say, even if the justice didn't work and even if they didn't go to hell, we will build this house like a, like, like a hell and we will transform it. We will, th this film is a kind of, um, utopic world, you know? In, in this fiction, we, we made a kind of a catharsis, uh, looking for justice, putting the, the, the people in hell, even if it's not the real hell, and, and, and making the justice work, even if it's not the human justice, is this under natural justice, but but it was that kind of an exercise, an exercise to make um, a catharsis. Mm. Wow. And back to more of these spaces in the film, uh, the courtroom is one of the scenes I think that is one of the most impactful, especially because we see a victim being able to testify and share her story uh, in the trial of uh, General Monteverde. So can you tell us more about what went behind uh, the, the creation of the scene of the courtroom, especially since we see Rigoberta Menchu, the Guatemalan activist front row. Um, so if you could tell us a bit more about what went into creating the scene of the courtroom and perhaps Rigoberta Menchu's involvement in the film. Yeah, I, you know, I wanted to be very, very close to the real, um, to the reality but I wanted to have some elements coming from the reality. So I'm transformed in a, in a fiction that I'm really put my vision of cinematic people making the, normally the, the real room is a white room and I put that in, on black and I make that more dark and more oppressive. But all the people who are playing extras in the field, in, in these scenes and in all the, in, in the whole film are people who are still looking for their relatives or their parents or their disparate. And all that people continue militing and, and, and making move the laws to, to have justice. And, and one of the most important um, char characters of, of that fight or uh, is Rigoberta Menchu. So I wanted to have Rigoberta Menchu in that scene. Rigoberta Menchu was a kind of an advisor for the film from the beginning, because, because I, I wanted to be sure that, I, I didn't want to be irrespectful about the, the, the victims. So she's one of the survivors and, and, I, and I, I asked, um, a kind of a permission for, for her and for a lot of, of associations. And, and after that, the actress who played the, the lead character, you know, the lady who is telling of the story, she, she lived, it was a, it was, 
I didn't knew at the beginning, but when, when she read this scene, she, uh, she asked me to change some lines because she told me it's so close to my real experience that if you just give me the permission to, to change some lines and like that, it will be easy for me because it will be my real life. And, and she proposed the tone and the rhythm. And I think the rhythm of that scene is perfect. It's perfect. I just wanted to, to have the translator because uh, I wanted to have the Ishil languages language starting for a long moment with the audience just asking where are the subtitles, you know? And, and after that, we understand that there is a, a translator and, and we start understanding in this with this ne neutral voice what happened to this lady. And when, when this lady finished that with this kind of attitude, very, very proud, uh, uh, very proud because she's not ashamed to tell the truth. And she's the opposite of my other characters in the house. So this scene for me was very hard to shoot uh, and at the same time very, we had a lot of pleasure to do that. It's, it's very contradictory, but, but it was the reality. So your comments actually give me a perfect segue to talk about language rights, right? So one of the things that uh, caught my attention, so is in, in this courtroom scene, as you've mentioned, you have the Ishid speaker very much so prominently centered. And then you also have uh, the Kachikel language uh, sprinkled in throughout the film. And so when you compare La Llorona to Ishkanul, as, as we know, Ishkanul was, was the, the first completely monolingual film in Kachikel that, that was ever made. So um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is that it seems like in this film, since the Kachikel is, is kind of interspersed at, at specific moments, and we talked about this a little bit in my, in my class when you came for my class visit for Indigenous Latin America, but I was curious if you could speak to the audience at the, at the main film center about the intentionality behind the uh, Kachikel Maya language use in the film and, and the decisions behind the scenes in which you feature indigenous languages. Oh, you know, it's very strange because in Guatemala, like you said at the beginning, there is 22 languages, um, Maya languages, one Xinka and one Garifuna, and, and the Spanish who is the most speak spoke, but ne normally indigenous people are all the time doing effort to, to speak Spanish and never or rarely people who speak Spanish make a little effort to speak some lang Maya language. It's like in USA, you know, normally all the people who came to USA make big effort to speak English, but in, but American people are not doing effort to, to speak other languages. And so for that reason, I, I love to use my language in my films when I shoot in Guatemala. And, but there is another more personal reason. And when I, when I was a kid, I had a stepmother and this stepmother was a kind of my my teacher, my friend, my love. I, I really spent nice time with her and she teach me kachikel and, and cook and cook. So I, it was very, very nice, like, like a relationship. And, and she made me understand that because she was indigenous, she was discriminated and I think at that moment, I, I really understood how my country works. And, and I start, I think the, the first action that I made against that is feel myself proud about my origins. So I'll, in a way, my work, I hope that my work will help, will help other Guatemalans to be proud about their origins. Mm -hmm. It's so important. Such, it's such important work what you're doing. So my other question, kind of following up on that, I, I, I wanted to go back to your comment on the subtitles, right? Especially in that scene in the courtroom when there aren't subtitles. So it can be a little bit 
kind of jarring for an audience who's expecting those. But I, I but then in the Kachikel scenes, you you do have subtitles. So I was wondering if you could comment on the processes for the creation of, of the subtitles for the film, per, particularly um, taking into account that Kachikel has been at least uh, seen as, as primarily an oral language. There's there's quite a lot of debate in terms of the standardized orthographies and, and the, the um, written variations of it. So if you could just comment a little bit about that. Yeah, I have the chance to have, you know, I have a very good relationship, more than good relationship. We are, we are very close with the actresses, Maria Mercedes Coroya and Maria Tolón. We had, we had six, six years working together. And so they are a kind of, um, they are my, my translation, my, my translators, and they are my interpreters because as you know, we can't really translate my own language. We have to interpret it. So, so in a, in a way, they they work with close to me to do that. Even when I normally I I start uh, writing the the script in Spanish, and after that I go to my own language. And if each time when I go to my own language, I have with me the actors. Because, because it's not the same thing if there is a, a Mayan princess telling something that is um, um, a rural man saying that. So in a way, when I do that with the actors at the same time, we are creating the characters. So, so I think all that work, it was In a big part, it was the actor's work. Mm -hmm. And following up on the use of Kachikel and Ishil in the film, with some actors speaking one language and some speaking the other, and then the majority of them speaking Spanish, I wanted to know if you could tell us a bit more about your choice of actors and perhaps your relationship with non-professional actors or sort of new and up and coming actors, especially since, as you mentioned, you worked with Maria Mercedes Coroy, who plays the role of Alma in the film, and Maria Telón, who plays the role of Valeriana. They were both in Ishkanul. And we also have Sabrina de la Oz, who plays Natalia, uh, General Monteverde's daughter, and she also appears in your second film, Temblores. So how has your relationship developed with these actors um, over the span of these three films? And what drew you to casting these actresses for their roles? I, I just want to tell something that I forgot in this in the last question about the representation of of different uh, Mayan communities. You know, I'm I'm just used to language in the film, but we use different costumes representing an, other communities, and we wanted to be. We couldn't not. We couldn't make the 22 communities because because it's a, a kind of an impossible. But, but we try to put in the film a lot of elements coming from different etnias to, to have a big representation, representativity, sorry. So to come to your question now, um, I don't know if the, if the audience know that, but in Guatemala, the industry is very, very small. There is just, I think two or three films per year. And so there is not a lot of actors, movie actors, I mean, theater, there is more theater actors, but there is not movie actors. And the problem with that is not a problem for, uh, for the industry, it's a problem for the culture. So the, because normally actors can become icons, cultural icons they can become voices, they can become um, representative of messages, of causes, and, and we don't have actors in Guatemala. So when I start forming actors, because the, the actors who play in, in, in Ishkanul was a non-professionals at the beginning, and we made a big, big and compact uh, kind of, um, atelier, you know, to, to, to form them. And, and after the film, 
I'm just was wondering the fact that I don't want to have one shirt after. I want to, uh, and, and we decided to follow them and became their agents and look for other works for them. And Maria Mercedes made them film in Hollywood with Julian Moore. And she made a film in Mexico and she made a film, a Syrian in Mexico too. And she's doing, a, she's making a film in Spain. So, so she's, she's the most famous actress in the country right now. And she's representing a lot of causes. She's uh, helping the cancer um, cause to, to find money to, to help people suffering cancer. And she's doing a lot of stuff. So, so I think that is, that is very important. So I'm just trying to, to, to build a kind of a troop to work with them and, and be happy because the, all, all that people is people that I love. And at the same time, trying to build icons to, because we need, we need them to, to have an industry. I absolutely love this because all of your answers have given me perfect segues to my next question. So thank you, Heido. I feel and like- you have a script. I know, right? I feel like you're making my job so easy, but you've been talking about your relationship with the actresses, Maria Mercedes Coroy, Maria Telon, so my, the, um, my next question is beyond working with these actresses, are there other ways that, that you have worked with, with Maya communities in Guatemala in your work in the, in, with film? And if you can kind of exp uh, expand on that. I, I know we talked about that a little bit in my, in my 135 class, the Indigenous Latin America course. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm working a lot. You know, work with the Mayan communities in Guatemala is to me a normal thing. There's a, there is a lot of people who doesn't work and doesn't mix with my own community, but they are the 70% of the population. So it's normal to, to be uh, together and, and share life and share problematics and all that. So uh, we create a foundation, the name is the Ishkanul Foundation. And with this foundation, we're trying to use films like a tool to create an impact and, and a, change, a social changement. We are more focused on women because we really think that we need to help women to, to accede to some uh, rights that in Guatemala they don't have. So it's very, very complicated, but movies is, movies is an easy way to talk about some very diff difficult topics. And we are bringing to Guatemala, uh, you know, there is not, in Guatemala, there is only the 9% of the population who have access to a theater movie because it's expensive and because the, the theaters are only in, in the main cities. Uh, so we are bringing movies, I mean, art movies or movies with content, social content, to the communities, yeah, and it's very funny because it's like the, the it's like like at the beginning, you know, you arrive with your little truck and you build your movie uh, outside and you invite people to come and after that people to talk about films. It's like we are doing now, and so we are very happy about that. And and in another way, we are forming women to use the, the cinematic language to understand how they can, they can, in a way, denounce what, uh, all the problems that they are living, or in another way, just sell their projects or their products, or in another way, you express themselves. And so we have a lot of nice um, results with that. And, and, I, and right now we want to, to start forming uh, people to become professional in, in movies um, because there is a lot of stories, silence in that country. So we wanted to, to push that people to tell their stories. That's great. Well, uh, I think this is a great moment to transition and actually um, go behind the camera and behind the scenes. And I'll be sharing some stills 
uh, that we receive courtesy of um, Jairo Bustamante's production company, La Casa de Producción. And uh, I'll be sh showing some stills right now as a way for us to continue this conversation and get uh, behind the camera. So Jairo, I have some uh, stills here behind the scenes of the filmmaking of La Llorona. And I wanted to see if you could just comment on some of them and kind of bring us closer to, to these moments. So, so in this still in particular, we have you within the house and you're speaking to the actress uh, Margarita Kenefik, who plays the role of uh, Carmen or Doña Carmen in the film. And we see her that she's in bed and it's those moments where she's either waking up from these nightmares or these terrors that she's having or she's sort of in the middle of sleep. And uh, this is a reoccurring nightmare where she's a mother and she's trying to protect um, indigenous children as if they're her own and she speaks Kachiken in these nightmares. But here you're, you're speaking to her. So I guess I wanted to know if you could tell us a bit more about what you were directing her to do in this moment. Oh, I don't remember, you know. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I think I, I, I was a little bit, um, I don't know, in uh, disagreement. I, I don't remember what happened at that moment. No, you know, it was a very, very um, complicated scene because in a way it's, it's when the character start doing that dramatic curve and this character is changing and this character is becoming La Llorona step by step. And, and, and La Llorona is possessing her. So, so the camera was really um, discreet in, in this scene. And, and I remember Margarita and I working a lot about how, how acting, act, acting from the, the inside. And, and I was very lucky because Margarita is great doing that. So, so I'm sure that we, we were talking about that. And Aiko Sato, who is the makeup artist, she's, she's working with me until my short films. And, and we have a very, you know, like, like with the actors, uh, with my crew, we have a very nice relationship. In a way, we are almost the same people working together from the beginning. That's great. We have uh, another still here. Yeah, so in this one, and, and you've kind of touched on this a, a bit throughout your, your answers to our other questions of this, that this uh, overarching theme of spirituality. So my question for you in terms of this behind the scenes still is that we, um, early in the film, you hear uh, Valeria, how she claims that she's Catholic, but then we have this, this scene at the end, but it almost looks like, there, so there's, there's certainly Catholicism, but then I also was kind of wondering if maybe there's some Maya spirituality from the traditional Chilkaya calendar, maybe informing that it's, uh, so I was wondering if you could comment on the religious practices that are informing this scene, kind of walk us through that a little bit. Oh yeah, you know, in, in Guatemala, there is a kind of a syncretism in, in religion. So Mayan religion is, is transforming Catholic uh, religion and, and a little bit evangelistic one, even if evangelistic is more, um, in a way more, I don't know what, what is the word to say that, but evangelistic doesn't permit really a, a Mayan practice. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little bit more, more drastic. And, but this scene, more than the tradition or the, than the religion, it was very important because it's the moment when these four women will be just one used by La Llorona. And it's the moment when when the four became one and, and the four became, um, because in a way they made that together. Even if it's Carmen who used her, her hands, uh, the other three was there and supporting and, and being agree in a way. So to me, this scene is very important because the, the original scene has La Llorona uh, turning around 
And, and during the shooting, I decided to put out La Llorona because, because I said, La Llorona is inside, inside them. I don't need any more La Llorona. Uh, mm. it, it, too much, it, it was too much um, horror film, you know? So I, I prefer doing it more psychological. It's very powerful, for sure. We have uh, one more still. This is our final still. And uh, in this moment, we have uh, uh, the character of Alma before the police brigade. And this moment is right outside the home, um, right before she enters the home to work as, as, a, as a maid. But the actual shot in the film is a bird's eye view of this moment, uh, seen from the house and seen from the characters that are in the house. But here the still is sort of like a full body shot of, um, of, of the characters and the protesters behind her. So I guess I wanted to know, why did you choose the bird's eye view of this moment instead of capturing this moment here with Alma alongside the protesters and, and sort of the police? Oh, I, you know, I, I wanted to have Alma or La Llorona announcing to the general that she was coming. And, and I remember when, when my team read the script, they told me there is an effect in this scene to, to give to La Llorona um, a, a big interest, like uh, you will do a, a Zoom or a traveling in or something like that. And I remember that I just tell them, just wait to see the eyes of Maria Mercedes Coroy. Uh, you will understand that we don't need any special effect on her. And she has these strong eyes and she can say a lot with that. So um, it's a kind of a mirada que mata, you know, like, um, so, it's, a one, it's, it's one of the scenes that I really, really love because that works and, and it's, we, we, we didn't need anything more than the actress and the actors are over here. And to stay a little longer on this still, uh, when I saw this still as, as sort of a behind the scenes moment, it also resonated with me because of how, how it dialogues with some recent police brutality in the United States in particular, where you have um, a woman in front of sort of this barricade of, of police. So I wanted to know what maybe informed you in capturing this moment or this confrontation between protesters, La Llorona and, and the police. Well, you know, in a way La Llorona is, after this scene, you have La Llorona just going through them and they cannot stop her. We decide don't show that because, but we can understand that. And it was a funny anecdote about that. And when we should, it, all that people are people who are who still looking for their relatives. That, as I said, even the actors who play the policemen. And and when we were shooting, and and people start uh, saying justicia, justicia, justicia. The policemen start saying justicia, justicia, and and we were there. No, you can you cannot, <laughs> because you are the police. You know, you are the other side, and and they were a little bit like uh, mm, mm, I want to say, I want to be part of the manifestation too, and the energy that we that we when that they built in the scene was so, so present. And, and that people were so excited about the film. They wanted to be part of that. And, and they told me, you know, even if the outside scenes, even if we finish that, the outside scenes, if you need to have us just uh, to feel the actors inside, to, to make feel the actors inside so our presence, we can come again. And, it was so crazy because, because really I, I didn't work in this film with people who, are, who was working. I was working with people who was being part of, of that. Thank you for, for giving us that behind the scenes look into these moments. Um, so this will be a moment now where we will transition 
uh, and actually open it up to our attendees and our audience members. And um, Julia would actually help us with that. Uh, she, Julia was, is going to help us moderate some of the questions that we received um, ahead of time uh, and some that have popped up now during the Q&A. Yeah, so, um, so again, if, if anybody has a question, you can drop it into the Q&A box and we'll get to you. So I'll first, I will start with uh, the questions I got ahead of time. Um, the, the first question actually, I had to put into Google Translate because it came in in Spanish. <laughs> um, but uh, the question is, I would like to know if the idea of intertwining a legend as a background for social criticism arises as a way to attract more audiences that are not used to auteur cinema, or if it was simply a way to reinforce the cultural identity of the work. Yeah, for sure. It, uh, we, we were talking about that at the beginning, you know, it was, it was the intention. And, you know, it's, it's just, it's just uh, uh, the strategy that I find, and uh, and I and right now I'm very happy because because the 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 legend and the oral gender uh, genre is is so helping the the story at the end. So um, I, I I really don't know how we had the idea, but I'm still thank thankful to that moment because I because I think it, it's works. All right, this is a question about your budget. Um, so was there a film or filmmaker who gave you inspiration when filming on such a tight budget? Oh, no, I don't know. You know, it's, it's just reality. We don't have any fund in Guatemala to make films and we don't have any... The, the industry is so small that people are not thinking on... on put some money in our films because, because there, is not a, there is not a market for that here. We are consuming the international films. So even for TV, we are not producing anything for TV. We are, we are consuming international TV. So it's very hard. But I have this, this chance to, to, to be a little bit French and live in France. And French, French state helped me a lot. And there is phones in, in France and I have a partner in France who believe in my work. So he helped me to find the financial part uh, and the Cinema Institute in France give us some safe money. And with that, we could at the end build the, my three films. Great. Um, so next question is from Tyler. Um, does La Llorona's use of magic revolve around the principle that it helps the audience cope with the horrors of genocide and the death of children? Uh, the film includes the theme of the restless dead, more specifically, Aori, sorry, I've definitely pronounced that wrong, uh, those who have been killed too young, and, oh boy, Biathenet. Uh, can somebody help me out here? Uh, <laughs> do you know what, what I'm trying to say? Um, it's a word. Be, be, uh, be, uh, here, I'll put it in the chat. Anyway, more specifically, those who have been killed too young and those killed in extreme violence to haunt a dictator responsible for genocide. Ultimately, does this use of magic make it easier for the audience to digest these horrors since many believe magic to be a psychological release or a coping mechanism. It's a very, very nice interpretation. And I think that's that in a, in a way is true. My real intention at the beginning was just have a, an appeal to the people, you know, it, it, it wasn't to protect the people about the, 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 the violence about the story. It's just great to call the people with with the, with all that element who who will package the 
the real story about the genocide. All right. Um, so uh, this is from Bevin. Uh, I noticed that the protest is very audible in the background of most of the film. So I find the moment when the protesters are suddenly silent and standing still outside the home really striking. What was the thought process behind including the sounds of the protest and that moment of silence? Oh, that, you know, the work with Sony in that film was very, very important. And I had the chance to start working with my song designer from the beginning of the script. And we really built all the um, manifestants, did you say in English? The protesters. The protesters like uh, like um, like one character uh, big and we we even build a kind of a curve a dramatic curve to understand the moment that we will really need them to to oppress our our, our characters in inside the house and and it was so like like you say in your question it was so impressive even even shooting when when we had some moment of silence the moment became very scary you know like a, oh there is something happening now because people are not doing uh, noise and so but, but yes song was very very important and we really work hard to build that and because we didn't want it to have someone making like a wow and jumping there and all that, you know, we, we wanted to be really, really suggestive. And, and that helped us to build all the outside world that we didn't have a budget to shoot it and to show it, show it in images. So sound became, came to, to help us even in the budget. That's a great question. I just want to see yeah. whoever says that. Yeah. All right, uh, so this is from Karen Heck. Uh, I just wanted to say that the song at the end was so impactful and beautiful and tied the story together in such a lovely way. I was wondering if it was written specifically for the film or one that you just knew or was associated with other La Llorona stories. Oh, thank you. It was a very nice moment too, because I, I really love La Llorona song, and I think it's very famous, uh, but still the original story with all that machist charge and misogynist charge, and La Llorona is all the time suffering because a man, so I decided to change the lyrics. And I call um, a very famous Guatemalan singer. She, she's name is Gabi Moreno. And, and she's, a, she's a very good friend. And, and, I, and I call her and tell, I need to, to make a, a, sing about La Llorona, a song about La Llorona, but changing the lyrics. And, and I have to release the film in, in two weeks. And she told me, let's start right now <laughs> uh, and and in a week we build the song and even that 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 was for the lyric but we even changed all the, the instruments because normally la llorona use occidental of or, or, or yeah occidental instruments you know like guitar and all that and we we only use mayan instruments and we only use marimba, chirimia, um, little ting, ling, ling, ling. I don't know what is the name of that. And, and we use all the Mayan instrument to do, to, to do the same melody. And, and it was a so nice work. And, and my, team, my team really, really, they made a, a, a magical work with this, this song. Yeah. And you know, it's because that song, the audience in theatrical screening, they, they still reading the, the, the credits, 
the credits because they are uh, they they are just enjoying the song. So that works for that too. Mm -hmm. Hmm. All right. Uh, when did you know La Llorona was done and how did you know you had accomplished your goal in telling the story? Oh, that, that is the most difficult part for a film because normally for you, it's like a son or like a daughter. You, you never understand when they are ready to go out. So <laughs> uh, I was... I. I had a lot of good friends who understand that I work with a lot of limitation in my countries, friends coming from the big industry in the, in the cinema world. And I called them to ask them advices about, about our um, uh, proposal. Or I, I, I think it was the, the five or seven cut of the film. Uh, and we we edited it. My my producer and I edited the film, and and I asked these friends to say, "Do you think that we are in the good way, or we need to call a, an editor, a professional editor?" And one of my friends, who who are part, who who is part of of um, Venice Film Festival, uh, answered to me, "I want the film for the festival. Submit it now." And so we start like that, and we submit the film, uh, and we won a, a prize, a very important prize, like a most important director or something like that. And so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, I don't think we'll get to all the questions. This is great. <laughs> you guys are asking so many questions. Um, so a uh, final question is a simple one. What are you working on in the future? Oh, I'm, you know, there is a lot of subject. I, I'm working right now on, on immigration topics. And, and I think it's a very important, because there is a lot of point of view about immigration, you know? Uh, and I really, mm. I really, I, I'm sure that the most part of, of the immigrants want to stay in their home, but they cannot. So it's a, there is a little part like me that I wanted to go to France because I wanted to make my studies, and, but I, I never had problems to go to come back. But the most part of people traveling around the world and looking for a new lives, they, they prefer to stay but there is not opportunities. And so, so that is a, it's a subject that interests me a lot. Uh, and, and I'm doing a lot of research about that right now. I look forward to seeing the oh. film. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great note to end on in terms of thinking of, of the future and your future work and its contribution to very important topics. Um, that are affecting our society. So I'd like to take this moment on behalf of the Maine Film Center and Railroad Square Cinema, also Latin American Studies uh, Department at Colby College. Thank you to Jairo for taking the time to chat with us about La Llorona and your work and uh, the impact that you've done to Latin American film and also to the Maya indigenous communities in Guatemala. And thank you to everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Julia. Uh, thank you to Professor Miller and uh, for all of you and all your great questions. Um, we look forward to do more of these activities in the future. Thank you. And, thank you. Yes. And, and I just, I just wanted to, I just wanted to plug our next week is our final cinema in conversation webinar. Uh, and it's about big night, which is um, Stanley Tucci's directorial debut in 1996. Um, so you can go to our website and sign up there and I've put it in the chat. So hope to see you all there and thank you all for asking your questions. Mm -hmm. Great. Bye -bye. Thank you everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Hi, Matthias. Matthias. <laughs>